Welcome all to the Cosmos Briefing. My name is Professor Alan Duffy, lead scientist of the Royal Institution of Australia, an organization established to raise awareness of the value and relevance of science and scientific methods in everyday life, sharing through conversations like this and engaging content on social and digital media with Cosmos, as well as in print with our latest magazine, how fundamental science is to our lives. Uh, the global economy sees unprecedented levels of resources extracted at great expense and effort, as well as polluting emissions in the process, all to forge new products. But all too often, these products then go straight to landfill at the end of their lives. A revolutionary yet beguilingly simple idea known as the circular economy would see all these products entirely recycled and their resources returned to form new products in turn. Just how realistic is the intention to transform the entire economy to realize this ideal? And what role can Australia play in forging a new, more sustainable approach to consumerism? Joining us to discuss these enormous fundamental questions is Professor Thomas Mashmar, uh, a professor of chemistry at the University of Sydney, as well as founder and executive chairman of Jalion Technologies, co-founder of Lichella Holdings, and inventor of its CAT HTR technology, most recently, he was awarded Prime Minister's Prize for Innovation in 2020, Australia's top prize in the field. We also have Professor Vina Zahajwala, an internationally recognized material scientist, engineer, and inventor revolutionizing recycling science, who pioneered the high temperature transformation of waste in the production of a new generation of green materials. In 2019, she was appointed the inaugural director of the Circular Economy Innovation Network by the New South Wales government. And in 2020, Professor Sahajwala has won and was made director of two new federally funded research and industrial transformation hubs. Of course, her greatest achievement, however, amidst all of this, is her induction as a Bragg Fellow of the Royal Institution of Australia just a couple of years ago. Now, before we begin with our discussion, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm joining you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging and extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us. We'll kick this off with you, Vina. Uh, very simply, what is a circular economy and, and why does it matter? Alan, uh, thank you very much for having me on board. Uh, circular economy is really, for me, a whole new mindset, a whole new way of living. And I think for all of us, whether we're consumers or we're working in the industry, in government, I think for all of us, it's about looking at our materials, our products with a whole new level of respect, recognizing that there is value in our materials and in our products. And all of this ultimately has to be looked in a holistic way that circular economy can only be realized when we appreciate and show that we can deliver on environmental benefits, but also equally on social and economic outcomes. And that's really when we can holistically achieve you know, the, the grand vision of what circularity could mean for our planet. I guess, is there, is there a distinction then between the recycling that uh, many of us will be familiar, for example, you know, the, I have my glass bottle bin outside uh, and e-waste or plastic, for example. Yeah, there is a big difference, right? Because I think, I mean, with, with e-waste, as you pick up that as an example, I mean, we know that our products, you know, our, our mobile phones, our laptops, all of these products evolve with time. So we can't just think about everything going back to the original form. And yes, it's one thing to be able to recycle our PET water bottles back into a new PET water bottle so that we can sort of see that looking like for like conversion. But I think when we are starting to think about the more complex products, you know, electronics contain different kinds of metals, they contain plastics and glass, and all of these sophisticated materials come together um, in a way that makes it all function well together as a whole entity, you know, our phones and computers. But I think we also have to recognize that therefore achieving recycling and circularity has to be also thought of in a far more complex and a sophisticated way where we can imagine that future products are going to evolve and change with time. But fundamentally, those materials that we have access to, we've talked about metals and glass and so on, that all of these in their quest to be transformed and brought into new lives over and over again, means our manufacturing technologies have to also keep up with the demands of what 
a new functioning product looks like. So if we're prepared to accept that, you know, we want so much more out of our tech devices, then we also have to be prepared to accept that how we make them, how we fundamentally access those critical materials um, has to be done in a way that we all see our role as people on this planet, that we all are consumers of products. So we all have to be participating in how we can value and make sure that we can all preserve these resources and materials in a way that we actually make it easy for future generations to access this without causing pollution on our planet. Now, Thomas, what's happening onshore here in Australia when it comes to recycling, to making good on the, the, the promise as Vina has outlined it? Yes, uh, well, I think Australia is moving in a good direction. The, uh, the, the various policy announcements by various states and government, uh, federal governments are going in the right direction. And it really recognizes that, you know, we, we use too much stuff. You know, we have, we have about a usage currently of 1.8 or so of the planet's resources uh, uh, right now. If everybody were wanting to live the same standard of living as we have in Australia, we actually would be using about six to seven planets. Uh, we only have one, Mars is a long distance away. So basically we need to use our materials better and uh, circular use is, is a clear one of that. And I think it has actually penetrated into the public conscience as well as into the political conscience. And so, so things are moving in a good direction. Um, I have been looking at uh, uh, plastics and uh, looking to recycle plastics and things of that nature. And, um, and, and so, so we, are, we are trying to really make a positive contribution by value adding to waste and not see waste as a problem, but waste as a resource. And that waste can be all sorts of things. It can be you know, lubrication oils, uh, end of use plastics, um, films that, that nobody can, can recycle, but also biomass waste from pulp and paper uh, factories, et cetera. So, so maybe just take us through, you know, chemically as well as industrially, how recycling might happen in a technical sense for some of those those end products. Yeah, so uh, so so there's the issue is always cost. So we have to somehow reduce cost because obviously we want to do the right thing, but it can't be at a incredibly high uh, economic burden because then then it just won't won't fly. So uh, in in case of our project or our process, the CAT HTR technology, catalytic hydrothermal reactor technology, we are able to take the water and use it as an agent of change. First of all, it transfers heat, then it helps to transfer the mass, it dissolves and pushes our waste through a reactor, but also it's a reactive material and we are able to transform, transfer the hydrogen in part from the water into our material as it breaks down. And the way we do that is we heat the material to very high temperature and the bonds, the carbon-carbon bonds are vibrating more and more and at some stage, just like a rubber band, they break. And at the point where they break, they are very high in energy. And that means that uh, they want to find a spot to be less high in energy. And often it means that they cross-link again, effectively form coke and all sorts of horrible precipitates with ash together, intractable. Uh, in our case, they react with water. And so the water heals that high energy site and I get a stable material. And that stable material is then a high, uh, a high value product. And I've done that with the hydrogen from water, not the hydrogen from fossil fuels, which needs to be you know, generated, activated, lots of noble metal catalysts, a lot of expense. That is the breakthrough. And that allows us to rethink this whole waste issue. So anyone who wants to hear more about hydrogen uh, and the, the potential future hydrogen economy, uh, see last uh, briefing, which is on the cosmosmagazine.com uh, website. Uh, now, so your, your CAT HTR essentially is able to take these um, you know, carbon rich byproducts, the, whether it be you know, potentially plastics or pulp or, or you know, biomass products. Any, any organic polymer and down yeah. to brown coal, all the way up from brown coal to, uh, to any kind of biomass, to any kind of plastics. Um, we heat them and the heat, think of, you know, putting, leaving a little bit of plastic in a saucepan by mistake or the handle burns, you know, after a while it gets, it gets, uh, it gets liquid and it starts to decompose and make a horrible smell. 
Yeah. That's what we <laughs> do. It once or twice, yeah. That's what we do, uh, except it doesn't make a horrible smell because in our reactor, which runs at uh, very high temperatures and very high pressures, so the water is not steam, but it's something called supercritical water. So it's like a gas that is so strongly compressed that it acts as a liquid, but it's still a gas. So it's very strange uh, form of matter. Uh, we don't experience it. The moment we would experience it and recognize it, we would die instantly. So it would be a very short moment of recognition. Uh, and you can't talk about it to anybody else, so it's secret knowledge. Um, this, uh, this, this, this process uh, allows us to, to activate the water and, uh, and stabilize this decomposing plastic so it doesn't make those horrible smells, but uh, valuable products instead. Excellent. So then acts as the feedstock for a new generation of products exactly. now. That goes straight into uh, refinery streams, which are commercially tradable uh, at bulk. So uh, naphtha to make, uh, mm -hmm. to make new ethylene, polyethylene, it goes in the naphtha cracker, then a light cycle oil, one can make lubrication oils out of that or, or airplane fuel, um, waxes, industrial waxes, they're all around us anywhere you look. I'm sure all your various electronic devices are also covered in them, give a nice tactile feel or the cup of coffee in the morning, the cardboard is covered in waxes so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't leak the coffee through. And then the fourth uh, is a bitumen uh, substitute uh, for our roads. All right. Now, Vina, it sounds, sounds easily uh, to, to achieve a circular economy with uh, the technique as, as Thomas has just described it. But considering the, the current tendency towards consumerism and waste, is a perfect circular economy achievable? Uh, is, is that even what we should be aiming for? Yeah, look, I guess, I mean, this is why, you know, when we talk about perfect circular economy, uh, I guess we shouldn't let uh, good ideas get in, uh, you know, get killed because it's not perfect, right? Because I guess, as, as we all know, you know, I mean, uh, good ideas eventually grow out of small things, small things that start out and ideas that can then be spawned off into a variety of different kinds of solutions. And I think to me, this is really the whole point that um, I think ultimately given, um, as we were talking about that our products have evolved over time, um, there probably is no such thing as perfect circularity, right? It's not as if this perfect phone that sweets the end of its life is now gonna come back to life in the exact same form. Um, and, and I think to me, this is really the whole point of really challenging the notion of what we're talking about when it comes to circularity, because what we're really saying is that in our lives, we need all kinds of products, whether it's the buildings we live in, whether it's, you know, cars, our electronic devices, all of this means that we need different kinds of materials um, that effectively allow normal life to continue, right? But I think in a way, it's also saying that when we think about how people across the world, including here in Australia, live in so many different types of communities. You could be living in remote communities that are not part of the urban population. You still have to then worry about what happens to those waste materials. Should you be just saying, look, I mean, you know, we don't have a facility anywhere in Australia, so therefore, you know, let's just send it all overseas. And I think that's clearly not an answer because of course we do know that thinking about how we transport materials, whether it's our waste or whether we purchase new products, there's a lot of carbon footprint that goes with, in fact, transport mileage. So also there's that holistic view around how we value these resources in a way that as much as possible, we start to think about regional solutions. And regional solutions is a way to think about circularity where you might say, look, there are a couple of towns that can actually support each other where one town might specialize in processing, you know, waste, for example, that comes from our cars, um, the, the glass waste or the domestic glass or what have you. And then somebody else might be processing some other kind of metal that's, for example, coming out of our electronic devices. And I think to me, thinking in a way that allows us to as much as possible, uh, focus in and hone in on how do we focus and how do we actually allow local businesses to take advantage of the fact that this is potentially a massive opportunity to generate revenue? You know, if I'm a local business, if I'm going to waste my money, you know, paying for ways to go to landfill, um, am I not better off investing that money collectively with 
say, a collaborative effort in my region to actually set up a localized production facility that allows me to take those waste resources and bring them back to life in a new manufactured form. So I think part of this is very much about a whole new way of thinking about business. And that's exactly how we've gotten into so many different partnerships. Um, for example, one of our micro factories that we've recently launched um, you know, in Kudamandra, um, that's an example where you know, a local recycler, you know, the guy was collecting things like waste mattresses and tires. And of course, from his point of view, the fact that, you know, he could suddenly see himself as a manufacturer uh, was as exciting for him as it was for us, because we suddenly kind of said, well, okay, that means we're now opening up the possibility of aligning recycling and, and manufacturing, but doing it in a way that all players, big and small, can participate. You could be in a large urban center or you could be in a regional town. But I think to me, the most important, I guess, learning and the takeaway that we've seen from all of this is it helps businesses think about diversification. And when you start to diversify and the fundamentals of circularity start to actually generate new ideas, I think to me, then we're also well and truly on the way where we are actually on a whole new materials revolution. Because you can imagine all these materials that are locked in these various devices and products that are basically crying out loud going, tell you what, you know what, I'm really useful. Don't consider me as a waste and don't dump me into landfill sites. So I, I can just imagine that this whole materials revolution uh, maybe I talk to myself too much, uh, <laughs> that you, you've got all these opportunities uh, that are just waiting to be harnessed. And I think to me, um, that's an exciting future that lies ahead of us. Really the adage, one person's trash is another person's treasure has never been truer for the circular economy. Now, Thomas, what, what is happening uh, that, that prevents us achieving this ideal, not even the perfect circular economy, if such a thing were, were possible as we've heard, but even just the best or the the you know the mass uh, yeah, recycling I think, of most. I think, uh, I think we will always need to extract things from the earth, right? So 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 mining is not going to go away. Um, recycling is not going to be perfect, and and the reason in part is because we need energy. So so we need to look at a whole of systems approach. Yeah. So what we want to do is we want to generate the best outcomes for the people and the planet, and 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 that means to be sensible about the use of energy to be sensible about the use of materials. As solar is coming down so very much in cost, uh, electricity is starting to play a greater and greater role. And in terms of real future thinking about technologies, that element of energy input is becoming so much cheaper that I can now think about doing things which might not have been possible before. So decentralized uh, decentralized manufacturing, whether it's in the, in the micro factories or, or, or other ways, even even uh, thinking about um, decentralized ammonia production based on uh, solar uh, solar electricity, uh, uh, or taking hydrogen at times of too much energy uh, being available uh, via electrolysis, and then using that hydrogen in in, in a more distributed way to generate um, aluminium uh, or iron. Uh, for example, and um, that 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 is just not possible in the current way in which we do things because everything is highly centralized, uh, very very efficient at that very central point. But there are lots of issues around that because um, I have to transport everything to that very central point of manufacture, or the central point where I could recycle. Whereas if we have a more distributed uh, system overall, the element of recycling becomes a lot more achievable. So it's a bit of a, a revolutionary concept where the circular economy, as we try to embrace it as a model of, of manufacturing uh, as, as much as waste disposal, it becomes a decentralized model. It's, it's about personal responsibility, but it's actually about the connecting of, of local communities and making real on their ability to be involved that's, in this new fine. sector. So, so if I could add, so... Uh, Regulation is obviously an important point, uh, and we want to protect the people, right? The, I mean, the, the general person just wants to be sure that their food wrapper is safe. It may have been used from, made from recycled plastic, but it needs to, they need to know that it is safe. And we've just had a wonderful project with uh, Coles and Nestle uh, and, and, and our tech, where we've uh, used KitKat wrappers and went uh, and collected them in a 
in a uh, uh, demonstration project in the Hornsby Council in, uh, in Sydney, uh, Sydney's north, where we collected all of the soft waste plastics uh, and, then, uh, and then sorted them in a mixed waste recycling facility, made them into an oil in our, uh, uh, in our process plant. Then that oil was refined to a grade that a resin maker could make new resin. Uh, the resin went, went to a filmmaker, the filmmaker made film, which went to somebody who printed on the film, the new KitKat logo. And so we were able to close the whole loop with food grade plastic at the end, which is the highest grade. So, so, so that, that is important in terms of uh, regulation, making sure that whatever we make is, is of the right standard. But at the same time, regulation can really hurt all of this because if my waste is defined as waste, even though I make a new virgin product out of it, and that's how the legislation currently is written, that's a problem, right? Because currently this wrapper is not a new wrapper. This, currently this wrapper is waste, even though it is not waste, it's indistinguishable from the current wrapper. So, uh, so, so these sorts of legislations uh, and, and regulation has to be, have to be uh, a change to really allow that introduction of waste materials into a manufacturing cycle. Another example is if I take glass and I grind up the glass to make road fill, yeah. um, then that is used, that is, that is uh, classified as waste. So I'm not really allowed to build roads out of waste in that way, but also on my site, I might have a license to store 10 tons of, uh, of glass waste. So I take 10 tons of glass waste and I make this product out of it. That's indistinguishable from the product used to build roads. But that would be another 10 tons. So suddenly I have 20 tons, but both of them are classified as waste. So my site, which is only licensed for 10, can only operate at half its capacity. So therefore all the costs are double what they should be. Those sorts of things, which are you know, unintended consequences of well-meaning regulation, need to be rethought. And it's not just in Australia. This is a worldwide issue. Sure. Now, we'll have an opportunity to speak perhaps in, in some more detail about specific policies that you, you both would like to see changed or implemented. But very, just very briefly, on those aspects you've mentioned, Thomas, are we, is there an awareness in government this needs to change? Is there, is there an appetite to, to approach Yes, so, so, so the New South Wales government is aware, and uh, and 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 so they are in a process of running a program to to understand better what these limitations are. Once this uh, project has finished, there will be a recommendation to the lawmakers, and then they will change um, the you know, they will make the the, the laws uh, so that the regulation can be changed by the regulator. However, the the, the pace is uh, somewhat glacial. And that pre-global warming glacial. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 so we are hoping that something might come out in 2025 or so, which is uh, not as fast as one would like. Okay. Now, Vina, clearly, um, changes of foot, albeit in some ways slower than we might hope here in Australia. But has Australians' approach to waste changed? And in particular, I'm thinking that that period when the material was stopped being exported. I, I recall in Melbourne, what an absolute, uh, um, almost a disaster that, that predicated. We, we suddenly realized that we, to a, perhaps our alarm, what we had been doing with our recycled waste before in terms of shipping it abroad. You know, has this been a, a key moment of transformation and are we continuing that journey? Oh, look, absolutely, Alan. And I think to me, that's where we've got to give a lot of credit to those Australian manufacturers, you know, and in our particular case, our example of green steel, as a case in point, we're using, you know, waste tires as a material that we can use uh, in the process of making steel uh, has been something that, um, you know, steel manufacturers have supported. Um, and I think from my point of view, it's also that opportunity where, um, you know, they're really proud to show leadership right here right here in australia and i think to me this is exactly the kind of leadership that we are looking for uh it's yes it's as much about research and government as as we've talked about but also equally importantly giving credit to a lot of those uh, manufacturers who are taking um those bold and brave steps in the right direction and they're doing it because they do want to play a, a very important role in not only looking at innovative ideas, but really wanting to be the first in the world to do it. So for example, in our case, um, you know, with green steel as an example, we've shown that, 
you know, not only Australia is um, obviously the first in the world to have taken this on as, as a technology, which is, of course, important to the world if we're going to be reducing our dependency on coal and coke in the process of making steel, but also equally importantly, I think we can see so many other companies in the world in the business of steel who are then approaching, um, you know, us to talk about the potential opportunity and what this could mean um, for the rest of the world. So I think to me, it's also a proud moment where, uh, yes, we might be a small steel producer in, in the global context, but by no means that makes us small in the sense of really creating powerful innovative solutions when it comes to, in this particular case, you know, using our waste tires as, as an opportunity for, for making of green steel. Well, maybe just explain a little bit more in a technical sense uh, how how old tires from cars can be used to help make steel. I think I don't think the, there's a direct obvious <laughs> correlation between the two. Sure, sure. No, uh, good point, Alan. Because uh, I guess I mean ultimately, you know, when we think about um, materials, you know, and and you know, we've talked about different kinds of materials, uh, and I think I was kind of referring to the point that fundamentally all materials really are alive and kicking. So even when a tire no longer works as a tire, um, you know, the, the basic molecules in it are still perfectly fine. And yes, it might not function as, as a tire on a car, but I think if we drill down to the very basic elements in there of carbon and hydrogen, the key elements are still very important when we talk about the kinds of steel making reactions that we're talking about here in this case, which traditionally that carbon would have come from coal and coke based resources. So what people of course would be looking at is how do you then go from, okay, so you're making steel, you've now got traditional you know, coal and coke that's used. And yes, of course, the manufacturing processes are complex and I'm not saying it's as easy as, you know, uh, turn off one switch and turn on another switch, but it's about looking at it in the context of manufacturing a product. So in this case, if we're talking about making steel, it's about being mindful that when you're utilizing these kinds of alternative materials, so in this case, you know, waste tires, for instance, it's how those materials are actually going to perform inside a steel making furnace. So it's not just enough to say, well, okay, here's, here's tire, just chuck it into a furnace. Of course it doesn't work like that. Um, it has to be engineered and it's got to be actually part of the entire process so that ultimately for a steel maker, what you have to see is if I expect a certain productivity out of my furnace, if I expect to see a certain quality you know, of material that I'm making, then as far as that steel is concerned, we like to refer to it as the steel doesn't know who its parents were, right? And so as far as that steel is concerned, it's saying, you know what, this is superb. I still have all the right elements, you know, um, in the making of steel, you need iron and carbon, and of course, many other alloying additives. So as far as the finished product is concerned, this is that ultimate case in point of that transformation where of course the kids kind of have really no idea of, of how its parents came together and ultimately um, you know, created this, uh, this steel. And I think to me, it's so cool when you can start to think of it this way at that very fundamental elemental level. And I think once you start to unpack that for a manufacturer, and this is why you know, there is a lot of science that goes into the making of steel and the manufacturing and the processes that occur inside a steel making furnace. But I think to me, this is where partnership between research and industry is so important because it's not just enough for us to say, right, we've done these experiments in our tiny furnaces um, here at the Smart Center at UNSW, uh, I'll just uh, leave it now. Well, that's only the beginning of the journey. The next important steps that follow are how we actually engineer that solution uh, in an industrial scale. And I think to me, this is where acknowledgement of our steelmaking partner, like Molikop, based out of, um, you know, Waratah, is important because it also acknowledges the hard work and potential contributions that uh, end users are actually an important part of this collaboration. And I have to say, I mean, without that support and participation and engagement in that science and engineering, um, you know, we really wouldn't ever be able to deliver any of these solutions. So I think to me, that's really where for us, green steel has come a long way. And, and we're super excited that we're getting people from across the world uh, wanting to know how to, how to make their steel green. 
Yeah, wonderful uh, endeavor. And indeed, we will have a, a Cosmos briefing devoted entirely to the topic of green steel, <coughs> excuse me, in the, in the near future. Uh, we, we even covered it through hydrogen last, uh, in the last briefing. It really keeps popping up. It's very exciting. Uh, but uh, Thomas, I might have you now be a bit more uh, reflective. Uh, this is, we're nearing the end of, of our briefing. And as I so often like to do is to imagine what the future holds. Now, Australia is deindustrializing in, in some areas, um, uh, but we need those kinds of broad skills and, and capabilities to facilitate this very exciting growing area of a circular economy. So looking forward, say 10 years, what does Australia look like in terms of its circular economy piece? Hopefully we've got some of the legislation in place at least by then, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, how do we manage that transition with the local industry sector that that Vina mentioned, that's such a critical part of this this entire so, piece. So, so I think uh, one of the key points uh, of, of Vina was uh, collaboration with the uh, with the university sector or in general the publicly funded research sector. I think that's key. Uh, and so my you know, the Lysella, the the company with the Cat HTR, that's Australian technology transforming not just plastic waste in Australia, but, but in the world, it's now uh, through this joint venture Mura in the UK, where they're building the first plant at 80,000 tons a year, has been teaming up with KBR, the world's largest um, engineering company, and they're rolling it out in 80 countries around the world. So wow. Australian technology is shaping not just Australia's next 10 years, but, but also in that particular you know, uh, instance, the plastic management around the world. So, so from that point of view, we should be all very proud uh, to have done that work here. And I think it leads, it leads, a, gives a clear message about what needs to happen. And that is this collaboration between government, which was, has been very helpful in uh, in helping to fund that. Uh, the university, Sydney University, has been a major supporter of that effort, and of course, private enterprise. And 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 equally. The kind of materials we make are key for refineries and are key for plastic makers uh, and film makers, etc. So we need to have this critical infrastructure um, being maintained to be competitive uh, in terms of our processes and allow the new kind of industry to grow. The skill set of the engineers, the chemical engineers, mechanical engineers to build these plants, to run these plants. That, that, that is really, really important. So I see a transitioning of, of traditional industry into new industry and the backbone of the big heavy industry still absolutely being needed uh, going forward. But then there's also this decentralized manufacturing and I spoke about uh, batteries, uh, sorry, I spoke about solar uh, and solar powering things, but, but usually you want to run a factory 24 seven, not just you know, you switch, it on, switch it off at five o'clock in the afternoon. So for that, we need to have a solar battery solution. And if one wants to do that in a decentralized way in Australia, so I've got another company that has uh, invented a battery that is specifically designed for those harsh outdoor conditions, 50 degrees, 55 degrees of heat, all ba other batteries die. This one is just extremely happy and keeps going. So, so that is again an example of Australian technology enabling that move towards a more sophisticated uh, kind of industrial approach that uh, is able to take waste and put it and look at it as a as a as an opportunity and put it back into a circular economy. So I feel, ten years from now, we will have a lot more distributed manufacturing and we will have a reoriented heavy industry sector. You know, how's uh, how's your ten year horizon looking? Oh, really look, uh, I, I couldn't be more thrilled. I mean, I, you know, I, I referred to our, our micro factory, the first one that we had just recently launched here in Kuramandra. And I've got to, of course, uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that uh, that journey of commercialization and the support that we received from the New South Wales uh, state government through its physical sciences funding. This is the Office of Chief Scientist and Engineer. And I think to me, that's the kind of support that I think we will see um, where government and industry and research, and I think we've talked about that. And I think to me, the ability to take partnerships and collaborations in a way that we can see a lot of these, you know, uh, processes being literally scaled to the point where micro factories are, you know, producing highly valuable materials from waste is I think going to be that all important, you know, you know, something that can seal the deal. You've got to make something that's value added and you can do it on a small scale. And I think to me, 
that's the beauty of all the materials um, that lie in our waste resources. And, and I think to me, it's about ultimately showing that decentralized micro factory solutions can actually be deployed in different parts of the country. Um, and indeed in many, many remote uh, communities um, where we probably would have never expected uh, manufacturing that we start to see all of these capacities being developed. And I think to me, that would be an ideal future for us to start um, you know, showing that there are many, many pathways to achieving circularity. And the fact that this first micro factory out of Kudamandra, uh, you know, was, was recently launched is an example that there are so many more opportunities just waiting to be harnessed. I want to be able to see a future where, you know, people are excited about recycling and manufacturing and can see this delivering impact, delivering impact at a social level, environmental level, as well as, you know, delivering a better planet for everyone well the the longest of journeys even a circular one begins with a small step but thanks to both of you Vina and thomas for your giant leaps in this race to a circular future uh, i want to thank you both uh we have further reading and resources on this topic and indeed ways to follow our guests today uh, at the cosmos web uh, cosmos website you can head to cosmosmagazine.com to see all of our activities at the institution and, of course, to subscribe to the Cosmos Magazine, available at all good news agents.